Our next speaker comes to us from Stanford University. David Dinney uh, studied chemical engineering and is passionate about global health and combating corruption. And he's going to share his perspective on AI as a tool for synthesizing knowledge at a scale that could make human beings obsolete. Please welcome David Dindy. First of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Flick for this opportunity to speak in front of such an esteemed audience. I have a question for all of you. Do you believe that the amount of knowledge that humanity can potentially gain is finite or infinite? Well, so first of all, raise your hand if you say that it's infinite. All right, now raise your hand if you say that it is finite. Interesting. I'd like to talk to all of you later on. Because almost everyone I ask says that the amount of knowledge that humanity can gain is infinite. In the same way that the combination of just, combination of just three colors can give rise to an infinite spectrum of hues, the finite elements of our intelligence can give rise to the ability to think an infinite number of thoughts and to learn concepts from an infinite space of possibilities. That being said, there are some obstacles on our path to infinite knowledge that I will share with you today. First, I will talk about the limitations of natural intelligence. Second, I will talk about the limitations of artificial intelligence. And third, I will talk about the need to merge artificial intelligence with natural intelligence. But before I begin, it's important that I first define two concepts, deductive reasoning and inductive reasoning. Deductive reasoning is the ability to apply a set of rules to a specific problem to arrive at a definite answer. Inductive reasoning, on the other hand, is the ability to combine pieces of information together to form general rules about a problem that has no definite answer. Now let's begin by talking about the limitations of natural intelligence. We humans, we're very good at, deduct at inductive reasoning, but we're not that good at deductive reasoning. And the reason why is because our working memory is limited in capacity. The working memory is the part of the short-term memory that stores information available for processing. Let's test to see just how good our working memory is. So this is the first phone number that I ever had. Can you memorize it in the next seven seconds? Why is it so difficult to remember a number like that? Oh, someone has it? Someone has the number? Yes? All right, do you want to give it a try? No, that's not correct. <laughs> close, close, close. But someone else has it? Okay. No. All right, just... I'll tell you, it's very difficult to do this because on average, the working memory of a human being can store at most seven chunks of information. This 14-digit number consists of 14 chunks of information, double what you can store in your working memory, or maybe a half of what you can store. And so, remember, I told you that deductive reasoning is the ability to combine, to apply a set of rules to a specific problem to arrive at a definite answer. How can we expect to arrive at a certain answer when the set of rules for a specific problem consists of more information than we can store into our working memory? Well, these days we do it by externalizing information. We write it on a piece of paper, which I'm sure you did, or we group chunks of information together and leverage our long-term memory. But these methods do not scale. To make matters worse, in our working memory, 
we tend to compute things serially. That is one at a time. If I asked you to add two to every digit of my phone number, you would only be able to do so one base at a time. Now, I'm not telling you anything that you don't know already. All I'm communicating is that we humans, we're not that good at deductive reasoning. Machines, on the other hand, are powerful at deductive reasoning. The average computer these days has a working memory that can hold up to 32 billion chunks of information. We can only hold seven. The average computer can perform multiple processes in parallel. But as I've shown you, we can only add two digits, two numbers, one digit at a time. Which is why when we build deep learning systems that can leverage the capacity of computers, we unlock the potential to scale deductive reasoning beyond what is humanly possible. Just look at this article. Now, what concerns me is that many jobs these days overweight deductive reasoning and underweight inductive reasoning. Here's data on the distribution of importance for 1,000 occupations in America. The x-axis is a measure of importance, ranging from not important to very important. And the y-axis is a measure of the frequency, in the sense that the number of jobs that fall into the specific window. There are many takeaways from this graph, but I want to focus on just one of them. That's best seen when you overlay the two graphs. The number of jobs for which deductive reasoning is important is more than the number of jobs for which inductive reasoning is important. This is seen in the relative position of the two peaks, and it's also seen in the relative difference of the density, relative difference of the density between in the high-ranking jobs. But I've, I've, as I've explained to you, we humans, we're not that good at deductive reasoning. I want to talk about machines now. I want to talk about what are the limitations of artificial intelligence. I don't know what it's like for you, but whenever I read an article about artificial intelligence, this is what I have in my mind. The media has a way of portraying artificial intelligence as if it were an intelligent being whose intelligence is far beyond that of a human. But that's simply not true. Artificial intelligence suffers from some critical limitations that I will share with you today. But before I do that, it's important that I first define what artificial intelligence is. Artificial intelligence is a very large discipline that encompasses many different techniques. But when people talk about artificial intelligence these days, they are mainly referring to deep learning. And so what is deep learning? Let's say I gave you a data set of German phrases translated into English. And then I asked you to build a system that can take in any arbitrary German phrase and make the appropriate translation. This arrow here is deep learning. More specifically, what this arrow is, is a function that consists of millions of different parameters. Let's call these rules. And with every example that you receive, you fine-tune these rules so that at the end of the day, when I give you an arbitrary example, you can make the appropriate translation. Now, the problems that deep learning systems can solve under this paradigm are fascinating. But let's not forget that all that we're doing is learning patterns. We humans, on the other hand, when we learn, we learn concepts. And let me show you that. Let me teach you an imaginary language called Convoco. It consists of just three words, so everyone's going to be able to learn it, OK? In Convoco, this means food, this means shelter, and this means clothing. Please raise your hand now if you understand Convoco. All right, I'd like for everyone to raise their hand, so I'm going to do it one more time, all right? In Convoco, this means food, this means clothing, and uh, shelter, shelter, you see? Shelter, and this means clothing. 
Now, please raise your hand if you understand Convoca. All right, you over there, can you please stand up? No, uh, the girl right next to you. What's your name? Teresa. Teresa. All right, great. What is clothing in Convoca? Okay, perfect. And what does this mean? Perfect. Well, since you are a native speaker at Convoca, I'd like to ask for your help. I'd like to create a word for water. Can you please show me what water should be? Perfect. Ladies and gentlemen, in Convoca, this means water. With just three examples, twice over, Teresa, was it? Teresa had the power to recall a word in Convoca. I would have had to show a machine these examples hundreds if not thousands of times before I could hope for it to make that distinction. And given the limited size of the data set, all that it would be doing is just memorizing patterns. Teresa, on the other hand, learned a concept. She learned that in Convoco, a word begins with a thump, and that the meaning of the word is contained in the gesture that follows. Just look at the word she generated for water. Her learning a concept affords her a rich, very efficient, and highly flexible representation of Convoca. Not only is she able to translate to and from Convoca, but she's also able to identify the most salient characteristics of the language and to use that to generate a word of her own. We cannot do this with deep learning. And for us to be able to understand why she can, Teresa, we're going to have to dissect your brain. <laughs> do we have your permission? I promise I'll put it back together. Okay? Okay, perfect. And so, Teresa, in her brain, she has 100 billion neurons. These neurons connect to one another through synapses to form complex circuits of neurons that underlie everything that she does. Her knowledge, her memories, her emotions, her decisions, all of them are encoded in these circuits of neurons. With every experience that she gains and with every new sensory input that she receives, these connections are strengthened and weakened. And these connections may strengthen or weaken over time in a process that is known as synaptic plasticity. Now, any given neuron can form 10,000 connections, which means that, given that there are 100 billion neurons, Teresa is capable of forming a quadrillion number of connections. Deep learning has drawn some inspiration from biological neural networks. In deep learning, as I mentioned, you have millions of parameters that you fine-tune with every example that you see. And the goal is to fine-tune these parameters so that at the end of the day, they generalize to new examples. Now, each one of these parameters can be thought of as a measure of strength of the connection between two artificial neurons. This is why deep learning models are often called neural networks. But where deep learning has not succeeded in modeling human intelligence is in applying compositionality in learning. Often, when we train deep learning models, we begin from scratch, as if there are no connections between neurons. But Teresa in Learning Convoco began with a fully functioning brain. She was already armed with the concepts of knowledge, of language, of translation and communication. She was already aware that communication can happen in multiple forms, in gestures, in speech, in expressions. And moreover, she had previous representations of the words food, shelter, and clothing, which she used to learn Convoco very efficiently. And all of these ingredients of concepts she puts together into a souffle that allows her to very efficiently learn Convoco. Unlike Teresa, deep learning is ironically very shallow at learning. All that it relies on are patterns trained in the context of one specific problem. And because of this shallowness, deep learning models require a lot of data and a lot of patience to get them to work. By learning patterns and not concepts, by learning to predict and not to explain, deep learning is handicapped in its capacity to reason inductively. 
So what have we learned? We've learned that we humans, we're not that good at deductive reasoning because we're limited by our working memory. We've also learned that although machines are better than us at deductive reasoning, we are better than machines at inductive reasoning. Which means that the most obvious path on our journey to infinite knowledge is to marry the two pillars of intelligence, artificial intelligence and natural intelligence. For only then can we transcend our limitations in deductive reasoning and AI's limitations in inductive reasoning. The union of these two pillars of intelligence is what I call collective intelligence. But rather than me explain to you the specifics of collective intelligence, I'd much rather show you what collective intelligence means from the perspective of an individual living in a future with collective intelligence. So, let me show you what collective intelligence means from the perspective of Teresa's great-granddaughter, Katerina. 62 years from tonight, Katerina will be walking home from a long night of research. With a university as empty as it is tonight, she's left with nothing but her thoughts to keep her company. Her mind wanders to the thoughts of her great-grandmother, Teresa. How weird the world must have been back in Teresa's days. Back then, people had jobs, people had nine-to-fives, people had vacation days. Although these jobs offered purpose in society, for many, they didn't offer fulfillment. You see, many people felt that they don't really use their brains at work, even though work was mentally exhausting. And the root cause of this predicament was that humans were being employed to perform deductive tasks. As such, work was repetitive and often quite boring. And the specialization that performing these deductive tasks required meant that the widespread interests and potential of human beings went untapped. While this system optimized productivity, the price to pay was billions in unfulfilled destinies. How lucky I am, Katerina thought to herself, to have been born after the era of division of labor. You see, at birth, Katerina, like every other child born after 2052, had her genes edited so that she can naturally express a protein that interacts with her neurons. This protein allows for her neural circuitry to be characterized and cataloged into a neural digital map, which only she can access. Her knowledge, her emotions, her memories, her entire cognitive state is digitized. In fact, the word digitized is so archaic. It held relevance back when humans and machines were independent of one another. But now, with the natural augmentation of the human mind into infinity, which is our collective intelligence system, the word has lost its significance. Speaking of infinity, Katerina is on her eighth degree at 26 years old, studying ways to improve the natural augmentation of the human mind into infinity during prenatal development. Isn't that funny, Katerina thinks to herself. Back in Teresa's days, it was customary for people to go to school, to learn just one field, and then to be funneled into a job. But these days, there is no such thing as a job. These days, one works by cultivating a wide array of interests. Because the, primitive that one, the primitives that one learns in so doing are valuable for infinity. Say, for instance, you were to learn how to drive a car. Deep in your mind, you have a circuit of neurons that encodes that skill. Let's call this circuit of neurons a cognitive model. Now, this cognitive model is very rich and very robust and flexible, which is why you can drive in almost any scenario that you've never seen before, like in a hurricane, although I wouldn't advise that. Even to this very day in which Katerina lives, the human ability to form such rich cognitive models remains unrivaled. 
which is why if you choose to, you can outsource your cognitive models to infinity to allow others to use them as primitives in building systems for deductive reasoning. Right now, Katerina, for instance, is actually outsourcing her cognitive models in biochemistry to pharmaceutical companies through infinity. Pharmaceutical companies use these cognitive models to understand the mechanism of action of their drugs. Not only does she get paid for the continuous use of these cognitive models, but if a discovery arises from their use, then she receives royalty payments as well. The next point I want to talk about is that she also used these infinity for her own research. So for instance, today she was trying to understand the, she was trying to find a compound that binds to a target that's of interest to her. All she had to do was to close her eyes and to think to infinity. And infinity sourced the collective wisdom of hundreds of different people, ranging from chemists to drug manufacturers, to find the optimal compound that binds the target of interests with high specificity, and that's also easily manufacturable. But infinity is not only useful for scientific knowledge sharing. In fact, many of Katerina's friends make, her living from, make their living from learning different languages, learning different sports, learning to draw different images. Because the cognitive models that they build in the process of that are useful for infinity. So let's take a moment to recap all that we've learned. We've learned that on our path to infinite knowledge, humans need to take advantage of their ability to reason inductively, to build artificial systems that not only share in this capability, but also, more importantly, interface with humans to allow their particular strength, which is deductive reasoning, to be utilized. Collective intelligence, which is the union of the two pillars of intelligence, will draw upon the inductive strengths of human beings and the deductive strengths of machines to allow us to encompass infinite knowledge. In the short term, collective intelligence will restructure society by altering the types of work that people do. Collective intelligence will liberate us to pursue and to cultivate all of our interests. With that, I'd like to finish off by thanking Teresa for allowing us to dissect her brain and for allowing us to use her as the model for human intelligence. Thank you. Let's open it up to some questions from the audience. One, please, once again, just give us your name, one question, and then we'll let, uh, we'll let the question flow. Who wants to be the first? Right here. Pays Katarina. The pharmaceutical company. So there are analogs to this, for instance. Right now there's Amazon Mechanical Turk, which is a form of data collection that data scientists use to get data. And for each piece of data that someone generates, they get a fee for it. And so the person who will be paying Katarina will be the pharmaceutical company. Right here. Um, my name is Bijan. Um, we're always talking about machines taking over the, the workforce. Why are we so sure that, let's say, in 100 years, there will be the concept of money or ownership or capitalism? Wouldn't that be in co totally, let's say, in conflict to, to the idea that you're saying? Well, I don't know. I can't see into the future. I think that it seems clear that you know, automation will take away many jobs. But in terms of the, you know, survivability of capitalism, I think that's a concept that's here to stay. And so I don't think that that will be taken away, but that's just my interpretation. Anybody else? Another question? Right here in the back and then... Uh, Christoph, and I want to follow on on the question of Alexandra. Um, if I understand correctly, that brain is basically outsourced to the company. Um, so my question on that would be what is she working then with? So does she have a copy of it? And B, if she does, what is she doing with her free time then? So uh, I'll say that, first of all, 
not her, it's not her entire brain that's outsourced to this company. Uh, her cognitive model, specific to biochemistry, is outsourced and used by this company as primitives to build deductive systems. In terms of what she does with her brain, she learns. Right now, she's on her eighth degree, researching many different things, because by learning, she becomes more valuable. She has more cognitive models that she can outsource. Does that answer the question? It does. Okay. This gentleman right here in the white shirt. And then... Hi, my name... Oh, please stand up. My name is Ludwig. Um, you, you've chosen with Teresa, obviously, somebody who's, who's a beautiful brain. Does this work for every brain uh, of, human, uh, of humans in the world? Because there's clearly differences between them. That's one question. The other one would be, um, how do we deal with religion? Um, and the question, uh, how they would like, uh, how, how they look at uh, human upgrading. I see. So uh, the first question in terms of, is Teresa's brain unique? and its ability to create these different things and to build cognitive models? I'd say no. I think we all have neurons in our brains and all these neurons form circuits that underlie everything that we do. And so every brain should be able to be characterized and digitized in such a way. In terms of religion... The sorry? The, the outcomes, wouldn't the outcomes be different if you have a very high IQ as opposed to a low IQ? That's true. That's very true. And so that's why the main incentive is to learn as much as you can. And these cognitive systems will not just be using one cognitive model, but will be using a wider array to get as much perspective as possible. And I believe the next question was about religion and how it plays into this. I have no idea. Uh, so uh, I'm sorry I can't answer that one. Um, I think that's what Harari is now referring to the new religion as dataism. Oh, I see. I see what you mean. Okay. Great. Um, hi there, Anthony. Um, I have two questions as well. The first one is about, um, you're basically, unless I mis misunderstood you, you're assuming that the, the, the human is a more effective um, learning substrate, you know, in trans words. Um, wh what assumption, or why don't you think that once we embody machines, you know, in the physical world as data collecting agents, why wouldn't they be better or faster at it? And, and then my yeah. second question maybe go, goes, goes way all, uh, you know, to, to the other side, which is once we have this hive, is this a two-way thing or is it just sort of a one-way thing where, where people, you know, upload their cognitive models or do we also sort of, you know, become one collective hive? So I'll answer, two ways. I'll answer your second question, whether it's two-way. In her research, Katarina actually uh, used Infinity to also perform some reasoning. <laughs> And so it's two-way in that form in the sense that individuals can use infinity as well to perform certain tasks or to learn about new things. In terms of humans replacing, or machines replacing the need for humans, if you think about it, these primitives that you have, these cognitive models, have been built since birth. So every experience you've had from birth, you know, from the first time you touched an object and you saw that it was solid, from the people who you met, all these primitives have been built. And so for a machine to be able to replace that, it would literally have to create an entire universe of its own and to have agents interact with that universe for these primitives to be built. And so I think that, yes, machines can not need humans anymore in that case, but the only way we'll be able to do that, in my opinion, is by creating an entire new universe with humans from which you can draw these primitives from. Great. And the last question, this gentleman right here. Hello, my, my name is Michael. Um, I want to know, you, you mentioned Katrina, and does she have the uh, rights on her intellectual property? Or to put the question out the other way around, what happens if she invents something? Mm -hmm. Is she, uh, uh, the judgment of the, invest, uh, in, 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 um, of the invention, is it on her or is it on the company? So, you know, pharmaceutical companies are very stringent with their proprietary data, and so if she invents something with a pharmaceutical company, I'm sure it will be over the same norm as it is today in the sense that since she's employed by the company, the invention is owned by the company. But let's say if she invents something separately, independent of the company, that's not related to the work that she's doing with the company. I think in that scenario, it will be very clear to be able to backtrack what intelligence and which input came in this invention. Let's say if she used Infinity to find that drug target, you'd be able to backtrack and say, it came from person X, person Z, person W. 
And so they can also be attributed under this system, just because you have data in terms of who is involved. Let's thank David. Thank you.